Welcome everyone to Dead Talk Live, and tonight we are joined by Deborah Voorhees, director, writer, and actor, producer, and well, you wear all hats. Deborah, thank you so much for being our guest. How are you doing tonight? I'm terrific. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it is my pleasure, and I'm really looking forward. I've been looking forward to talking to you since we booked you, and let's just start off. Let's go back to 1985, okay? Let's go back okay. to Friday the 13th. The New Beginning. Tell us how you came into the universe of Jason. Was it an audition? Well, uh, I mean, did you seek out the role? No, it was an audition. Um, I had an agent, and what they do is the studios will send over sides. And that's, you know, the portion of the script mm -hmm. uh, that would be for a certain actor to read from. And um, they are kind of given a description of what they wanted. And they felt, my agent felt like I was right for the role of Tina. So that's the one I only one I ever re uh, read for. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just, uh, I went in, it was a huge catacol. I mean, tons and tons and tons of people lined up. And um, so uh, to get the role was pretty special. So let me ask you this. Uh, going into the audition, uh, were mm -hmm. you aware? Were you a fan of the Friday the 13th franchise? I had seen the first one and liked it very much. And so uh, initially, though, we didn't know that it was Friday the 13th. Ah. Um, it was called, um, I really repetition or something like that. Yeah, something they always give there. these projects to keep them secret. Some right. Kind of code they don't name. want everybody. To, yeah, exactly. They don't want everybody to know exactly what's going on. And, um, and I can see why they would want to kind of keep it a secret for a little while that it was a Friday the 13th film. Now, by my third audition, I first auditioned, I went to the casting director, then I went in and auditioned for the director and then I auditioned for um, the producer. And though the producer was more of an introduction, he mm -hmm. still had me read for him, but the director decided that yeah. he wanted me at that point. So, um, but um, yeah, it, uh, yeah, talk about an honor. I'm just um, thrilled to be a part of this series. Now, uh... I mean, you know, since you've been in the movie, seen the movie, you have obviously become a huge Friday the 13th fan. Is that pretty accurate? Yes. Now, you know, Friday the 13th, part five, a new beginning. I am, we're frozen. There oh, we go. Okay, I can see you. We can see you. Uh, now, Friday the 13th, part five is uh, mm -hmm. where Jason is not the killer. Okay, they right. tried to go a different route. Uh, it was uh, something different in the Friday the 13th franchise where they gave it a plot twist and it ended up being a paramedic right. whose son died on ca in Camp Crystal Lake and he decided right. to take on the persona of Jason Voorhees to avenge uh, the death of his son. So when you got the role, uh, right. did they give you the whole script right up front? Did, you broke up for a minute there. Did you ask me if I oh, knew about the ending, no, the no. twist at the end? No, I asked you when you got the role, did, did you get access immediately to the whole script or did they give you like yeah. only your parts? No, only my part. That's typical, particularly when you have a kind of a whodunit situation where everybody, you know, you don't want everybody to know your ending. But it happens a lot on other types of films, too. Um, if you are not, you know, one of the lead roles, you usually don't get a full script. And sometimes even lead roles don't get the ending because the twists, they're keeping it so tightly yeah. under wraps. So uh, when you... Did book the role, did you go back and watch, you said you already watched the first one. When you booked the role for Tina, did you go back and watch two through four? I'm actually not at that time. I did it later. Um, at, at that moment, I really just kind of wanted to be in my character. When, um, you know, when I get in front of a camera, I kind of make the world go away. Mm -hmm. I 
try not to see anybody around me because if you do, you end up having that look like somebody's over there paying attention to you and you don't want that look on your eyes yeah. that, you know, have you, if you're walking, talking to somebody and you feel self-conscious because you feel like somebody's watching you and so you have to get them to leave, they have to go away. Yeah. So I close myself completely off and don't hear anything but my director. That's 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 a great way of approaching it. It brings like a, a lot of authenticity to the role that you are playing. So let's fast forward now. You film the movie, the movie comes out, you start to become a fan of the franchise. I always say to my audience that history judges a movie and where it sits. Not the critics when the movie first comes out. Time will put it in its place. You, as a huge fan of the Friday the 13th series right now, looking back on A New Beginning, the one that you were in, how do you feel about where that movie sits in the franchise? Honestly, I think that it's more true to the original because the original was a whodunit, mm -hmm. who's doing the killing. And they are both about bereaved parents who are responding irrationally and slaughtering those who really didn't have anything to do with the death of their kids. Exactly. So to me, it's more true to the original. Um, no, I was going to say, I never really thought about it like that, but you're 100% spot on. In the first one, we have Jason's mom, Pamela, uh, and then fast forward uh, to part five, it's another parent who's avenging the death of his son. You think that was done purposely? You know, I don't know. I kind of would think so, um, but I, I'm not really sure. I, I do think they were trying to go a different direction because supposedly Jason was completely gone. They had looked at maybe having Tommy Jarvis come back and basically be mm -hmm. the killer for the next one, which I think would have been a really interesting take. I like that angle because that's very realistic. Mm -hmm. And to me, when there's realism in there, it gets a lot scarier. Yeah. Just like in 13 Fanboy, it's not about a guy in a hockey mask who comes up out of a grave and starts killing people. That's great fun. It's it's fantastic fun. Um, but it's not realism. No. You don't sit there and go, after you get out of the movie and get to the parking lot, you're not looking for some undead creature to come and attack you. Uh, but in something like 13 Fanboy or a whodunit, like the situation with the first one, that's a human being who is doing the killing. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I think would have been nice in part five and that could have made it even more of an intense whodunit is if they would not have arrested Vic. Yeah. Let him escape. So you start thinking that it might be Vic doing it. And then you're suspecting Tommy and Vic. And some people are just kind of still wondering if it's Jason, come back to life. And um, then you've got a really solid whodunit. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's about the only thing that I think was a real miss. Other than when my boyfriend in the film, when they do the um, his kill, I felt like the one thing that was really missing was a really loud sound of crushing bones. <laughs> yeah. I, I never, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. One of our prior guests, Tom Savini, mm -hmm. he had a big role in the original Friday the 13th. He's actually the one who gave us a glimpse of young Jason coming out of the lake. And they brought him back right. for part four, the final chapter. And the way he explained it is they told him, we want to bring you back to kill Jason. And that's why part four is called the final chapter. Uh, mm -hmm. They wanted it to be the final chapter, but, you know, it's Hollywood and money rules right. the day. Uh, it was a big success. Um, so they decided to go a different route with part five. Uh, right. Bring in a different killer. And it was it was really good. It was really good. But apparently the diehard jason fans from two three and four were not satisfied because it wasn't jason okay right so that right. force 
I, I honestly didn't see much of that. I know that Tom Morga and Dick Wien and Melanie did um, hear from some fans, but I really didn't even know that there was a controversy about it for till several years later mm-hmm. because I did attend the premiere, but after the movie was out, I wanted to see the movie with the general crowd. And that general crowd, I felt like, would give me a better representation of how fans are going to be reacting. So I went and sat in the very back corner and just sat there and watched. And I'm telling you, I did not see a single negative reaction. I sat there and just kind of hung in the crowd, listening afterwards. People loved it. It They loved it. So there were tons of people who loved it. It made tons of money. There was a segment of some really diehard ones that had a problem with it. But I'll tell you what, most of them today no longer do. No. Or at least that's my personal belief based on the number of fans who come to me and tell me it's now their favorite or one of their favorites. And, you know, that they even gone to so far as to say, you know, I was one of those guys. It was so silly because when I went back and looked at it, it's a great slasher with some of the best kills in the entire franchise. Absolutely. And it's true. It is. Absolutely. And it's a great movie. Uh, and I don't agree. Like you just said, people were just disappointed because it wasn't Jason. And for me, that's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. And that sort of forced right. the studio when it did come out, when it did, when the time did come to do part six, well, we got to bring Jason back. Now, how do you bring a guy back right. who got a machete halfway through his skull? You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great thing about movies. <laughs> you know, they can make anything happen. <laughs> so they went the old Frankenstein route. You know, they brought Tommy right. Jarvis back. You know, uh, suffering from severe PTSD, going to the cemetery to make sure that Jason, for some reason, he thinks that he's going to come back, but yet he ends up being the one that brings him back. Uh, through that whole lightning rod, you know, Frankenstein monster. And Tom Matthews, who played Tommy Jarvis in part six, was also a guest of ours. And it was great to Mm -hmm. hear him speak on just how much fun they had on the set and that opening sequence. Even though it really pushes the boundaries of suspension of disbelief, it was a fun sequence of events to watch. So tell us, Deborah. At which point did you actually become like a hardcore Friday the 13th fan? Probably meeting the fans uh, because the Friday the 13th fans and horror fans in general are really amazing. Yeah. They, um, how can you not get tied up in their excitement? You know, initially they were like, okay, you got to look at this one. You've got to see this one. Cause then I saw a couple and then I saw three or four and they're going, oh no, 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 you missed this one. You got to go see this one now. And so they really um, brought that and, and seeing their enthusiasm. And, you know, there is something absolutely brilliant about the series. Who would guess that this series would appeal to so many? kids even today nine ten year olds they all know friday the 13th oh yeah they know exactly what the series is about so there's all these new fans coming through who would have thought i mean every single friday the 13th was panned by every single critic out there did anybody ever say anything nice not until horror fans started writing and doing reviews of their own Mm -hmm. right and the day and, um, when the internet came along. Right. And so what happened? Okay. Uh, what were your thoughts on general horror before you took on the role of Tina? Where not just Friday the 13th, but horror in general, before you took on the role right. of Tina, were you a fan? Were you just indifferent to it? Explain that to us. The ones that I liked the most, um, I really liked like the Universal Monsters, huge Frankenstein. I love Frankenstein. And um, I also, um, the Bad Seed, 
was mm-hmm. one of my favorites. That's a great one. And that's a lot of people don't remember that one because that was from the 50s. Yeah. And um, I, there's something about a blonde haired, pigtailed little girl who's a serial killer that's just too much fun for words. Yeah. And um, and then ghost stories. I love ghost stories. Um, after seeing The Exorcist alone at 12 and being scarred and unable to sleep for about two weeks, then I started, I was like, okay, I'm not watching scary movies alone. If I watch a scary movie, one, it's either got to be during the day or somebody is sitting there and they are holding my hand and then we are going to watch something comedy afterward. <laughs> but I still really enjoyed them. You know, it was like one of those things where I'm like, I was the one like this, <laughs> you know, but that's the fun part. Isn't that the fun part of it scary is. movies? It is. And that's what, what is draw- being genuinely scared. Yeah. You said you were 12 when you saw the exorcist. I was around 12 when I saw Friday the 13th part five. Uh, and how did it, did it, was it scary to you or was it fun for you at that time? Well, considering that the first horror movie that I saw, I was about five. Uh, I was pretty desensitized by the time 12 came along. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Friday the 13th Part 5 came along to where even at the age of 12, you know, I I knew that this was make-believe and I just enjoyed it for what it was, you know, as entertainment. Right. And just loved the, the genre. And that's why I'm a lifelong horror fan. And, you know, and you're right about the fans. There are no better fans in the film or TV industry than horror fans. I mean... You're absolutely right. I absolutely agree. Yeah, unmatched, unmatched. So now, fast forward to now, would you call yourself a huge horror fan? Yes, definitely. Of all, like, you know, spanning all the subgenres of horror? Or do you still like slasher? Um, I would say my favorite are creature features and uh, ghost stories. Yes. Creature features are just fun. And one day I want to do a Frankenstein movie. Um, direct it. And, but, and then ghost stories, those always scare me. Paranormal. Because me too. you can't prove it yeah you can't prove if it's real or not i was watching a uh, really scary um uh, ghost story and um we have this little dog and it well she's not really that little she's quite big actually but she looks over at a corner of the house uh like at eye level of what a human like if a human was standing there but nobody was there yeah and she starts growling and i tell her to stop and I'm not talking about like a little growl or anything. She's, rrr, rrr, rrr. I mean, really loud and continuous and kept on and kept on. And I'm like, no, this is not the time. I'm freaking out. <laughs> that is so true about paranormal movies. I think though, that's yeah. my favorite subgenre because mm-hmm. I believe in it. And to see right. it on the screen, yeah, Hollywood embellishes it with right. everything. But it's the fact that it, can happen i do believe in it that is the only subgenre of horror that i can say to this day truly terrifies me uh and going back right. to it really gets me yeah i mean i remember the amityville horror and those beady mm-hmm. red eyes oh god i had nightmares about those beady red eyes and you know talk about ghost stories uh right. the amityville horror has to be one of the top so at which point in your career did you step into behind the camera, directing and whatnot? Uh, that was about 10 years ago. I did a film that I could basically, it was me going to film school to learn the behind the scenes stuff. And um, I directed and produced a film called Billy Shakespeare, mm-hmm. made tons of mistakes and did a lot of things right. And, but I learned so much. It was, it's a what if comedy about what if Shakespeare never existed until now. And uh, then after that one, um, I went on and did a kind of like an arty um, dark comedy, Mm -hmm. which was like a black and white and everything. But it was about a um, socialite who was obsessed with the whole idea of murder. 
And I still would like to expand that concept into a full fledged slasher or, you know, you know, serial killer type uh, film at some point. Um, then um, I started doing a lot of shorts for a little while and music videos and very on working on things that were very specific to things that I wanted to do. I E since I want to do a ghost story, I did a short about, um, I actually did it from Othello cause I'm a little bit of a Shakespeare geek too. And, um, in Othello right at the end when, um, it's the, the murder scene, mm -hmm. uh, with, um, Ophelia or not Ophelia, I'm sorry. Um, running big blank on the name for the moment. Yeah, uh, but too. anyway, it's, uh, he's murdering his wife. Yeah. And instead of my Yago was a woman and um, a ghost, an ex-girlfriend, whispering in his ear to kill her. Mm, that's an interesting And take. it was all contrived. And so, but part of the reason I wanted to do it was I needed to experiment with um, putting a, a green screen and working somebody where I have the actors over here doing one thing, but then I have to take my ghost over here and she's interacting with them. And so I needed then to cut it in. And there are times like she touches them. And so I had to figure out how to make all of that work. Mm -hmm. And it ended up working really well. And it got into some, um, you know, film type festivals. And in fact, um, it was um, over in England and um, played over there. And uh, let's see, I had a music video that played at the Kenneth Brannan Shakespeare uh, Film Festival there. And uh, so it, it ended up being really good for me because it kind of gave me some of the chops yeah. to know what to do and to be prepared. And I definitely I want to do a crazy, crazy, scary ghost story. <laughs> How, when did writing come into the picture for you? Have you been writing your entire life? Very early. Okay. Like yeah. Um, I was a journalist for many years after I left um, Los Angeles and uh, basically stopped being an actress. Um, I went and um, got my uh, journalism degree. And uh, so I was writing, and then I was writing before that, I started writing screenplays very early on. Most of them were pretty, the first early ones were pretty terrible, which they should be. That's when you know you're learning something, <laughs> and then you keep going, I kept writing. And so Billy Shakespeare was one I wrote, and um, then so was, uh, you know, obviously 13 Fanboy as well. All right, so. let's get to 13 Fanboy now, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. It's Now, guys, our viewers out there watching, 13 Fanboy is a movie that Deborah wrote, directed, uh, did mm -hmm. you play a producing role in, in it as well? I did. I was actually, I was a co-producer with Joe Paul Rysak, and he was also my writing partner. So I was okay. a co-writer on it. So before we get into that, um, tell our audience when and where it's coming out. October 22nd, this uh, Friday. This Friday. And um, it's going to be in select theaters around the U.S., and on about every major VOD platform out there. So what I would do is the best thing to do is go to 13fanboy.com, go to the, click on the section that says now playing, mm -hmm. and it will show you all the theaters. And just to give you an idea, we have Chicago, Minneapolis, New Orleans. Um, we have um, Lexington, Kentucky, um, places in LA. Um, and that's where we're going to be having some premieres uh, this weekend. We've got three special showings in L.A. out that way and then Phoenix, Tucson and several other places. And uh, we'll also be doing some showings in London and I'll be there in nice. November to do some promotional events there. Nice. I want to thank you and your team for sending us that screener link to Fanboy. Uh, mm -hmm. What we did for the first time in our history with my team is there was mm -hmm. about four or five of us and we held a watch party so oh, cool. we're spread out across the country and there was a group of us that watched uh 13 fanboy together uh we loved it uh -huh. i mean the movie is phenomenal the idea the concept 
bringing back uh, the actors from all, you know, the various prior Friday the 13th mm -hmm. movie and coming up with you this unique idea on how to put it together. Let's start from the beginning. How did the concept of 13 Fanboy come to you as a writer? Um, well, I was actually talking with my producing partner, Joe Paul Reisick, um, and he, um, are we frozen again? I no. Think we're frozen again. No, I could see oh, you. Oh, okay. Okay. You can still hear me? Yeah. Okay, it's just my computer then. Yeah. Okay, so Joel was asking me about um, horror convention and horror fans and wanted to know, are they um, scary? And I said, no, not at all. He said, well, has anything scary happened at a horror convention? I was like, no, no, not at all. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. I mean, horror fans are just fantastic and easy to talk with. And they're just a bunch of grown up kids, you know, having fun and playing dress up like for Halloween. And he said, well, has anything ever happened that was kind of creepy? I said, well, yeah, there are a couple things. And uh, but not at horror conventions. One of them came over as a message on Messenger and it basically said, um, wouldn't it be cool if you died in real life like you did in Friday the 13th? No, that would not be cool at all. I like horror movies because they're make-believe, yeah, they're pretend. Uh, I don't want anything to do with that stuff in real life. And so I blocked that person. Nothing came of it. Uh, as far as I know, I have never had contact with that person again. If I did, they were very quiet about it was them and probably felt embarrassed that they yeah. did it. Then I, um, it was actually only about two or three weeks later um, that I'm sitting at my desk at, late at night. Um, I have French doors, so it's completely dark out there. And um, I live in out kind of in the middle of nowhere and it's just kind of forest and trees and grass and stuff up there. And I have one single light and I'm writing and my phone beeps. I check it. The first thing it says is I'm watching you oh, where I was sitting at that moment. That was very possible. And, um, then I got a series of another three texts and basically the person was seeing claiming, uh, pretending to be Jason and um, basically saying he was there to kill me. And so I, um, that freaked me out Yeah, no and kidding. I blocked that person. Uh, luckily, as far as I know, I've never heard from that person again. It may have been just somebody completely innocent, just trying to play a practical joke, but it really wasn't funny to me yeah, at well, all. But how would they get your and, number? Um, that's the part that bothered me the most. Mm -hmm. The Facebook part would have been disturbing, but not at the level of the phone, my exactly. personal phone. Exactly. And so um, I blocked him, though. And as far as I know, nothing has ever, you know, I haven't had contact with that person. And once again, if I have, they're probably very embarrassed and never want to own up that that was them. <laughs> but, you know, that's when Joel said, that's our movie. And I'm like, mm, no, 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 no. That's not our movie. Our movie, um, I'm thinking monster that's not real. <laughs> this is way too realistic. Yeah. And this is way too scary. And um, But after about four or five nights of really realizing that it really, the whole concept was so frightening that I was like, yeah, this is actually our movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah, there we went. And how difficult... Okay, so you got this idea, you wrote the screenplay, now comes trying to, you know, the hard part, trying to get financing, right. getting the cast together. Let's start with the cast. Uh, did you personally reach out to former Friday the 13th cast members uh, or did you have did. somebody else do it? Um, Joel, had, Joel did some and I did some. Um, I talked to some people at some conventions and things and 
you know, I wasn't just asking them to play a character in a movie where there is a stalker. I was asking them to play themselves exactly as former Friday the 13th or as Dee Wallace, a former Halloween actress, playing themselves being stalked. There is a level of fear that that goes up way, mm -hmm. way more. Playing a character is not personal. Mm -hmm. Playing yourself is very personal. And so some people immediately loved it and were on board. Like Dee Wallace was actually that way. She says one of her first comments was, why hasn't anybody done this? Why didn't anybody think of this? This is brilliant. Let's go. It is, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so um, then uh, Tracy Savage came on right away. Um, I did talk to Adrian King about being part of the um, – the story, but she had a stalker in real life. So it was way too close for her mm -hmm. for comfort. Yeah. And so she passed. Um, but then uh, Lar Park Lincoln, we brought her on board and um, she had a stalker for six and a half years. So everybody deals with that kind of thing differently. For her, it was kind of tackling it head on. And for Adrienne, it was like just, you know, not to go to that place. Both are perfectly valid ways of handling it, and I respect both and choices. I got, I got to interrupt you. A lot of our viewers and people out there don't understand that there are a lot of people out in the world who have a hard time separating character from actor. And it's right. scary. Right. It really is scary. Uh, you know, and, you know, talking right. about somebody who had a stalker for six and a half years, man, I can't even imagine. You know, right. how terrifying and, that is. And Adrian's was a very serious situation as well. She has yet to share me, with me the details of the um, her situation. But, um, but yeah, it's, um, it is a very different thing. There are those handful of people. My guess is that maybe they're missing a little bit of their frontal cortex. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Adrian. You know, I think it's probably. I'm sorry, Adrian. I've, we've spoken with her. She's one of the sweetest, nicest people out there. Oh, she is. Yeah. She's lovely. So yeah. And um, go on. So I think I think though that you're right. I mean, there are people out there that have trouble, and so that's what we were really looking at with fanboy. Is um, we didn't want him to be just this killer with no understanding for who he is or how he became because this is more realistic base mm -hmm. and with that i wanted um the monster to be at least semi-relatable in that you might understand why he might feel the way he feels and if you were left alone and put into a basement and didn't have much interaction other than uh, the actors you saw on Friday the 13th and Halloween, you know, you m many people might end up having a natural connection to him where they feel like they're their family. Yeah. And so he really felt betrayed when he wrote to them, uh, wrote to the, the actors and never got a response. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Uh, so gathering up the and he calls them. He calls them by their their character name. Oh yeah. He doesn't call them by um, their personal name. Yeah, and uh, I got to tell you that twist at the end. You know, there's a twist, and then there's another twist. It was brilliant on how it's done, and we'll Thank leave, you. we'll leave that at that and let the viewers uh, watch it for themselves. So you got the cast, you got everybody together. What was it like being behind the camera and directing uh, D. Wallace and all these other uh, former uh, ca uh, actors, characters from the Friday the 13th uh, franchise? It was wonderful. I, that is my favorite job by far. I've done many things um, through my life. Um, I have even taught British literature and things. And there is nothing that I love more than directing. 
It is uh, because it's like you're a conductor mm -hmm. and you're keeping everybody doing the things that they need. And it's like, you need this, go here, do this. This light needs this, this. And you're explaining, no, I want more of this mode, mood. No, we need more, some more fog. We need, you know, and you're just, so it is, it's like being an, um, a conductor and I, I love it. So it's brilliant. How difficult when you got the script done, uh, was it during the writing that you had to pitch it to production studios, eventually distributors? How difficult was it to find somebody to pick this project up? Well, we I didn't even go that route. Um, and I wouldn't recommend it for any filmmaker. Okay. You know, do it yourself. Handle it yourself. So I had already met um, Joel Paul Rizek, and he has actually he has a workshop called Be Your Own Hollywood. And um, in reality, you can write scripts on spec all day long, and more than likely they will never be picked up. Because yeah. frankly – when you have a production company, you usually are writing stuff yourself or you have a partner who's doing the writing. And so why would you go to somebody else? And somebody else may send you something, but in all likelihood, it's not exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. But you can write what you're exactly what you're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I highly recommend anybody who has it. First thing to do, uh, besides get your chops up, start doing a bunch of shorts. If you're on the technical end, mm -hmm. do some shorts and learn how to use the equipment and work the equipment and understand the ins and outs of making a film. And then take that baby that you really want to see done and do it. But before you do, make sure you understand the roles of the producer and what you have to do to actually get it picked up. The big thing is to get it picked up by distributor. Yeah, and getting it into the right places and the right advertising in order to get it seen. And um, no. he puts out step by step what to do. And you can literally go to beyourownhollywood.com and um, watch the um, several hour videos on how to. And it will literally you'll walk out of there and going, oh, my gosh, I've just been given the magic formula. Yeah, a lot of people. That's how I felt. A lot of people think that making a movie is only for the rich and famous, and that's just completely yep. not true. Now, speaking mm -hmm. of finances, was this movie self-financed, or did you get investors? How did that work out? The several different things. One, um, we did do an Indiegogo. Mm -hmm. A lot of that was because I really wanted to involve the fans in it as much as possible. But we, and while we went more than doubled our what we were asking for um we still in order to make this film the, the way we wanted to make it we had to raise more money yeah and so yeah we uh raised it via investors and both joel and i together that's awesome now uh did you go the film festival route to pick up a distributor or did somebody come in during production and picked up picked it up for distribution well joel had a lot of experience already he had had it's like 24 or 25 films out that he's uh gotten distribution for and so that's where he really took the lead and started going around and pitching it to different people honestly we did not have a problem um, as far as people not willing to accept it. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we had a lot of people who were interested, a lot of distributors who were interested. And why? Because we followed that the Your Own Hollywood model. And you've got to have, you have to have a name actors. Yeah. You have to have a story that really appeals to people. And there's a whole list of the things you need to do to make it happen. And um, so we really didn't have those issues. We decided to go with a group called BMG Global, who yep. was just opening up a, another branch called Desktop uh, Desk Pop Entertainment, and um, that was going to be their kind of genre uh, for them, and you know horror films. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're kind of there. We're their tentpole that they're starting with. 
Of course, they had all the right connections with all the uh, VOD platforms and that sort of thing, and they brought in somebody to help with theatrical. We had to make a big decision on whether we were going to go. Initially, we had planned on going theatrical for at least two weeks um, and then opening up in VOD, mm -hmm. but a large company that um, is called In Demand, and it um, includes like Charter and Cox and some of the really big pay-per-view stuff, yeah. they demand a day and date release. And given that we were just, when we were making this decision, we had the variant coming with COVID. We didn't, we were a little worried um, some theaters might shut down again. And, um, but you have to have it in theaters at the same time. Yeah. Um, but you don't have to have that many cities, but you have to have of the top 12 markets, you need to have 10 of the major cities. Now, why and, is it, um, I'm sorry, to interrupt you there for a second, why is it that you need to have those markets? That's what they require. Okay. I think part of it is because they like to be able to say in currently in theaters yeah. on it. And, but they have 90 million customers. And for us to be at the top where we'd be recommended, because they, they love the concept, they loved everything about it, but um, you do for to be in the recommended area, which is crucial, because mm -hmm. if you're not in the recommended area, how are you going to get noticed? Exactly. It's not that easy, because then you're just a pebble in this whole big area of sand. Yeah. So, so that's why we, we made that decision, which meant we weren't going to have as many theaters, uh, walk-in theaters as we would have liked. But, um, I think by far given COVID and all of the things about us, it made more sense to do it this way. Yes. Yes. Now, uh, when it comes to marketing, uh, I gotta point this out. I have not seen that much marketing uh, out there in regards to 13 fanboy is that just mm -hmm. budgetary constraints uh because well i mean as far as um marketing goes i mean we've had tons of presence like on social media and within the horror community podcasters and mm -hmm. that sort of thing um we will be having advertising but it will be uh, very direct advertising for like um specific areas for live walk-in theaters for specific you know where the film is playing and then very specifically on the vod platforms yeah. like um you know with voodoo and um some of the others voodoo is very believe it or not is very big on horror oh i love voodoo and, i love voodoo. yeah <laughs> yeah they, they're very big on horror and so that's one of our platforms we also have um xbox and um iTunes and Amazon mm -hmm. and it's a it's a pretty long list. It's all if you if you go and look, it's all on 13fanboy.com. Yeah, and those are all very important, but here's mm -hmm. what I think is going to happen. The mm -hmm. movie is so great, it's going to come out on video on demand and to select theaters across the country uh this Friday. But then the important part, uh recommendations you know mm -hmm. uh people are going to recommend it to their friends uh they're going to see a lot of the characters that they came to know and like and love in prior friday the 13th mm -hmm. movies the hardcore right. horror fans are going to tell their friends and their friends are going to tell other friends word of mouth there's nothing that can replace word of mouth advertising you know You're right especially in the horror community mm-hmm it, it's going to spread like wildfire, and I really will be ve would be very surprised if this movie's not a big hit. Because Thank you. Because the concept uh, is brilliant. Bringing together the cast was brilliant. Uh, I love the fact that you brought C.J. Graham, uh, mm -hmm. who played Jason in just one movie. He played Jason in Friday the 13th Part 6, uh, and right. you brought him back. I got to meet mm -hmm. CJ at a convention this past May. Uh, wonderful man. Uh, great to talk to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, now, D. Wall, as far as like picking the star of the movie, mm -hmm. how did you get to picking D. Wallace 
Uh, mm-hmm. You know, she's huge. She's a brilliant actress. Right. But with a cast like this, what made you hone in on D. Wallace being the center of the story? Um, initially, when Joel and I were first talking, I was wanting to mix up Halloween and Friday the 13th. So we were pulling from both franchises. Mm-hmm. And he really wanted to stick to Friday the 13th. Yeah. I don't think one was a, the be- was a necessarily a right or wrong answer. It was just a choice. Mm-hmm. And so an- initially, we kind of concentrated on what was going on with Friday the 13th. And um, in time, though, out in the back of my head, I just felt like I just that was D was the one I wanted. And um, so uh, finally, um, we sent her the script and uh, she agreed. And I I just I think that woman is brilliant. Oh, yeah. And after meeting her, uh, she's also got the kindest heart. I just adore her. But as an actress, man, she know her stuff. You know, she just gets in there and she makes it seem effortless Mm -hmm. because she immediately walks in and she is, you know, her character. And in this situation, you know, she was being asked to be herself. Mm-hmm. And that's not always the most comfortable thing for any actor. What do you, what do you mean I'm going to be myself? <laughs> no, I, I'm an actor because I want to pretend I'm someone else, you know. Mm-hmm. And obviously there is um, a lot of pretending. Mm-hmm. Let me see. There we go. Obviously there's still a lot of pretending when you're playing yourself because it's a fictional situation. Yes. But, uh, yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I couldn't be more thrilled to have her in the film she's just amazing she is she's brilliant in the film uh when how long did the shoot take we had an initial 11 days of shooting in july of 2019 because we had very limited availability for both kane hotter and for Corey feldman Mm -hmm. so we shot those and then we prepped and got ready by that january 2020 and uh, finished, and that was another 24 days, and then a few days in LA to get, you you notice that there were some shots and some people who lived or were visiting LA, and so we needed some stuff in a car. Um, Judy's house was supposed to be in LA, and while we shot, her home was actually in Rio Doso, New Mexico, of all places. We found a place that actually looked like it could be LA, and, but then I needed an outdoor establishment shot. And so I found a nice beach house that we could rent for a couple hours and do some drone shots around it nice. and um, use that. So I got, I got to ask you this question when it comes, cause you mentioned Corey Feldman and Corey Feldman was Tommy Jarvis in the final chapter. Uh, but why he doesn't play himself in uh, 13 fan that's board. right right so how was that decision made he he was the only one who isn't playing himself and so when we talked with him that was the first thing that he he basically said he didn't want to be himself he wanted to play a character and it made sense because he was going to be playing kind of a creepy producer Mm -hmm. that didn't fit him. Whereas we tried to find things about each person to add in something that was very realistically them. Mm -hmm. So it felt like them, but Corey was one where it absolutely is not him at all. And so um, he could just, you know, be bold and broad and, He's great comic relief. <laughs> his character is funny. He, uh, his yes, character is yes. very, very... He basically took the script, got the general idea, and 100% ad-libbed from there. Really? 100%. Yes. Wow. Well... And um, which just cracked me up. I mean, if it didn't work and if it was bad... It's a director's nightmare. And um, there was definitely some juggling and things I had to do to make all the scene work. Um, Cause, but 
it was so funny and so good. I knew we were just looking at comic gold. There is no way I was going to yeah. rein him in. <laughs> now, the movie, uh, since it's coming out this weekend, have you had a chance to bring the cast together for a special screening before it goes wide? That will be this weekend. Okay. Um, we'll have, not everybody will be able to be there, uh, but um, quite a few members of the cast will be there on, uh, we have a Friday showing, a Saturday showing, and a Sunday showing in the LA area. The Sunday one is actually in Orange County. The Friday night showing will be at the Dynasty Typewriter, which is the Rita Hayworth Theater. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the Limley NoHo. And then in, we have um, in Orange County in Santa Ana, we have the Frida Cinema. And all three of those will have question and answers with um, some members of the cast. And then I'm also bringing in my cinematographer, Ben Meredith and my composer, Tamer Surrey, to be a part of it. And at all of them, Adam Marcus, who directed Jason Goes to Hell, part mm -hmm. nine, uh, will be there and will be hosting it for me. Wow. He's a dear friend of mine. And so I was, I was really hoping he would do it because I know he will put so much into it because he's a very charismatic man. And um, so... I was hoping that maybe he could do one or two of them, but he told me a few days that he'll be there for all three of them. So, so I'm just thrilled. You're going to have a very busy, busy weekend this weekend. Are you excited or nervous? Yes. Are you excited? More excited, I have to say. More excited. Yeah, definitely. I would think so. Uh, I mean, you just must be thrilled that the day has come. And especially right. you shot this before COVID. Yeah, you didn't right. have to worry about anything with COVID. And now the time has come, time for the movie to be seen. I think it's going right. to get rave uh, reviews. The fans are going to love it. It's, you know, Friday the 13th, you know, like the big slasher movies from the 80s, Friday the 13th, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, they have survived and generation after generation and to bring a different aspect, a different angle to Friday the 13th, a franchise that we have not gotten a new movie for a very long time because of legal issues, and to bring just a little bit right. back of that franchise to us, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for giving... Well, thank you. You know... It, I, I'm just thrilled. You know, it means to us, a lot to us as fans who grew up with uh, the Jason Voorhees and the Michael Myers and the Freddy Kruegers to get a different right. angle and a different perspective. My producer wants me to ask you, before the movie's even released, he wants me to ask you uh, any ideas of a follow-up sequel to 13 Fanboy? Absolutely. If this is um, something that the fans really respond to and they love it, we will definitely be doing a sequel. Okay, so I've got to expand on that question just a little bit more. Uh, this is my own curiosity. Would you stay with the Friday the 13th theme, or would you kind of maybe go to the Halloween theme or something else? That's a really good question. Honestly, uh, we've been kicking around that idea for a while. I have an idea of what I would like to do. Uh, but I'm also open to some more. I think that it's possible we could go with the different series. Um, I, I don't know yet. Um, it's, it's definitely going to be an interesting yeah. ride to figure it out. And we're, we're pretty uh, much... We'll see how the fans respond. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're pretty much out of time, but I got They're the most important to me. Exactly. Exactly. Not the critics, you know, people get no, paid to no, write reviews. No, I mean, I respect the critics. I was a journalist for a long time. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's the, the fans. fans. It's about yeah. the fans. It's about the fans. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. One final question before we have to go. Uh, mm -hmm. Because this is not a Friday the 13th movie, but you are using like the actors and sort of character names. 
Did you have to get any kind of approval from the franchise, the people who own the rights to Friday the 13th to do this? Well, our lawyer, Larry um, uh, Zimmerman, Zimmer, Z wait, Zerner. Zimmerman, wait, Zerner. no, I'm Z Zer Turner, thank you, thank you, yes. Larry Zerner was uh, also a guest he, of ours. <laughs> exactly, he, you know, of course, he was in the film too. We actually have more connections with Friday the 13th because Eric Lehman, we have one of his songs in it, and we have one of Tommy McLaughlin's songs in it yeah. too, and both, of course, part of the franchise. And um, sorry, my, my brain, I've been doing this a lot oh, today, yeah. so my brain just froze on me for a second. I got you. But anyway, uh, no. Um, we, you know, vetted it through the lawyers and everything, and um, we're good. Uh, what we couldn't do is to put the characters in the film. But we can't, they are playing themselves, and so as themselves, they were in the movie, and that's yeah. perfectly okay to say. That's not a problem. They can reference we can say Friday their, the 13th. Yeah, they can, yes, we can okay. reference it. We can't. What we couldn't do, like in the horror convention with the banners, we wanted to be able to use images from Friday the 13th. They would not give us the rights to do that. Um, so um, we couldn't have... Like, I couldn't go on there playing the role of Tina. Yeah, yeah, I totally get that. I totally get that. But and... I can be Deborah Voorhees who played Tina in the movie. Yes, okay, and that makes perfect sense from a legal standpoint. But I had to ask you because, you know, with entertainment, legal rights, I mean, talk about headaches right. and you do. Anyway, Deborah, we're out of time. This hour just flew. Thank you so much. Guys, check out the movie this weekend. It's called 13 Fanboy. You won't regret it. It's a great movie. If you're a horror fan, even if you're not a diehard horror fan, you're going to love this movie, uh, especially if you're a fan of the Friday the 13th franchise. You can absolutely love this movie. Deborah, you did a brilliant job writing and directing this. Uh, I mean Thank that you. with all my heart. Uh, we enjoyed it. That watch party that I held with my team to watch it, we all loved it. Thank you so much. Uh, like I said, the movie is going to do great. I have no doubt, especially once word of mouth starts spreading about it, it's going to take off. And I wish you nothing but the best of success with this movie. And I hope I get we get to see a sequel of some sorts. Uh, Me too. I really John, do. It has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. It, pleasure is all mine. Thank you to our viewers for tuning in tonight. We have a nice audience. We have a nice big audience tonight. So, uh, people, Friday the 13th fans, they're out there. They're out there and they're craving You're more. The best. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you to Deborah. Thank you to our viewers. Till next time, guys, on behalf of Deborah and myself, stay safe and stay walking. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.